So second molar headaches, what a greater truth there is in dentistry. I like to think about our motivations in dentistry and especially occlusion being the Panky Institute. And I know we have a lot of alumni, some of the instructors, but also a lot of you that haven't been exposed. So when we look at challenges in occlusion, the second molar is something that we encounter in basic dentistry. It pays our bills and bread and butter on an everyday basis, but it also drives us absolutely insane. It is almost what I call the gateway tooth though, to comprehensive care. So I'd like to share kind of some of my observations, some of my successes, but also my failures that I've encountered over the years. When I start a webinar like this, I guess I'm supposed to introduce myself. Well, my name's Mike Melkers. You know that if you signed up. But I'm just a general dentist. I am visiting faculty at the Institute. But I have a resume that says I succeed and fail in a grand fashion on a daily basis. So I would just like to share that with you as we go through the program. Dr. Pankey famously says he never saw a tooth walk into his office. Well, this one walked into my office just this afternoon, and you're looking at that. It's not just the gold crown. It's the amalgam core. got some cement in there and part of the tooth. What I really wish walked into my office was not just that, but I wish these walked into my office. I wish these patients that were the high risk, the ones that stress us out, the one that freak us out, that really just put us behind schedule, and all those unforeseen challenges, I wish they had red flags on their head because that would make life so much easier. But of course, that's not the reality. What I'd like to do this evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are in the world, I'd like to talk about some of the very typical red flags that I encounter with second molars that we all encounter with second molars. So you can maybe see some of these challenges coming then we're also going to talk about the challenges that we encounter and how we manage and mitigate them. So one of the first things that I'm going to talk about, and you can look all over this mouth and you see wear, you see erosion, you see attrition, you see pins, you see decay, you see failing composites, but then you also see that dot on the palatal cusp of that second molar on the lower right side of the picture. That's not just a dark spot on a second molar. That is actually a hole. And that's a hole in the palatal cusp of a second molar that is either a semi-precious or non-precious crown. This is what I call one of the top red flags, which is exclusive second molar wear. And you'll say, wait, there's wear everyone, everywhere, Mike. There's wear on almost every tooth. Yeah, but when I see wear like that on a second molar, that isn't commensurate with the wear that I see on the other molars. I think about condylar seating, I think about high muscle activity, and I think about my restorations breaking because that is what that tooth looks like. <clears throat> and that crown that you're looking at there is honestly only two years old. And this patient comes to me wanting a full mouth rehab. Now, tonight's webinar isn't about full mouth rehabs, but like I said, the second molar is that gateway tooth that unlocks the key to being comfortable with restorative dentistry, that is being comfortable with restorative dentistry, not only on a single tooth basis where we lose restorative room perhaps, but also that gateway tooth that helps us delve into planning and executing comprehensive care. Because if we have a tooth that looks like that, whether it's the perforation in the second molar there on the lower left, or the molar above it, that is where we have the, the mesial cusp fractured off there, that second molar, it has to do with high muscle forces. So if a patient is in MIP and they're not in a seated position, and if the temporalis and masseter are at their highest level of muscle activity, and that condyle during that parafunctional event is forced seating that condyle, then that second molar there is taking all of the abuse. So that becomes an issue. We're going to talk about that, not only how to screen for that, but what we can do about it when we do do that screening. 
Now, the next thing that we're going to look at, aside from that condylar seating, is I'd like to look at super erupted opposing cusps. So super erupted opposing cusps are interesting, and you see this area in this tooth where the patient has a fracture on the distal marginal ridge, but they've also lost a restoration. And you can see there's some flowable composite or composite there in the distal preparation. And the opposing tooth has actually super erupted down into that space. Now, this is a, a mounted model, and you can see that that is the same uh, picture, or that is the same tooth from the previous slide. And you can see that the tooth has, the palatal cusp of the upper second molar has super erupted down into that space. And how do we manage and how do we mitigate these threats and these forces that threaten our success? Well, you're also going to be looking at something very similar to that, not where the restoration has fallen out, but where we have dished out occlusal anatomy. And these look like bread and butter cases. And these are some of the scary ones where you think, and some of you may or may not crown one or two or all four of these molars. These are actually opposing quadrants on the same patient. But when you look at the models on this patient, <clears throat> that same dished out occlusal anatomy that you saw where the restoration was flecked out on the previous case, here, perhaps overcarved in amalgams or over, uh, over polished or overcarved composite restorations, in this case amalgams, allow that palatal cusp, that upper tooth, to come down. Where we, and I and I can say I've I've committed this sin, I've overcarved restoration just to get through my day, and here it's been so severely overcarved that you grind all the blue spots. And that actually allows some occlusal changes to go on. So how do we approach all this? And, I, and I, I've shown you one case with the exclusive second molar wear. I've shown you another with a super erupted palatal cusp because a restoration is flecked out. And then I showed you another one with dished out occlusal anatomy. If that starts to get unsettling, you don't know how to approach this. And I apologize if I, I don't mean to come across as, as preachy or judgmental. When I give this presentation, I, I, I feel this inside my chest and inside my stomach that I'm talking to a previous version of myself and lessons that I wish that I had learned earlier on in my career. In that, in this case, what some people call the Melker's mantra, I, I've heard this well before I came out of my mouth, is how do you want it to look? How do you make it fit? And how do you mitigate threats? Now, this isn't just about anterior aesthetics, but any tooth in the mouth, we can want to make look like a tooth. So how do we want it to look? How do we make it fit? How do we mitigate threats? So Dr. Pankey is famous for the saying that's uh, for occlusion 101, when the patient closes, the teeth should all touch without deflection. When the mandible moves, the forces should be minimized. So how do we manage? How do we minimize? How do we make things touch without deflection? Well, I'm going to have this funny word called equilibration. And I can think back to when I went to what was called E1 back then instead of, or C1 rather than E1, equilibrations absolutely freaked me out. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be grinding on people's teeth. This doesn't sound good. It sounds totally scary. And then the next day, what do I do? I put in a crown or I put in a composite or I put in an amalgam and it's high and I'm totally fine adjusting a restoration. So if I could, and if we could perhaps take some of the mystery out of equilibration, equilibration is just achieving the state of equilibrium. And equilibrium is defined as a state in which the opposing forces or influences are balanced. So how do we actually get there? Well, we can reshape. That is, we can adjust those restorations, or we can restore, place those restorations. We can reposition. That is, we can move the teeth. We can remove the teeth, 
where we can replace the teeth. So reshape, restore, reposition, remove, replace, run away, refer, revarone, all of those things can bring the teeth into that state of equilibrium. So what if they're not? Well, here we're gonna show just a little quick kind of animated video. On the left side of your screen, what you're gonna see is teeth coming down into axial load. And on the right side of your screen, you're gonna see teeth come down and they're gonna be hitting on inclined planes. So when that comes down into axial load, the forces are distributed down the long axis of the tooth. Now, if on the right side of the screen here, they hit in the, on the inclined slope, one of a couple of things can happen. In this case, the tooth was moved out of the way, but if that root structure was solid enough and foundational enough in the bone, it was, that is, if it was anchored, that tooth didn't move out of the way, well, then the cusp might move out of the way. That is, it might break. So the first part of equilibration or that state of equilibrium that I'd like to talk about is reshaping. So when we look at a contact that comes down onto an inclined slope, that is when the lower buccal cusp hits the buccal slope of the upper palatal cusp right here. What I previously thought, I thought, well, you know, if forces hit there and they're closing and they're going up and down, well, then the forces will continue down the long, long axis of the tooth. And I was painfully mistaken in that assumption. What I, what I came to realize through my learning and my reading and honestly watching some of my restorations and teeth break is when the <clears throat> opposing force comes down and contacts an inclined slope, the force is actually directed perpendicular to the contact point. So when that upper palatal cusp, wherever part of that cusp comes down and touches the lingual slope of the lower buccal cusp, the uh, force is actually directed at that kind of 90 degree tangent to the contact point. And what happens when that occurs? Well, that cusp breaks off. Unlike when we saw in the little animation that the tooth moves and we see fremitus perhaps in first bicuspids, sometimes in second bicuspids, but we rarely see that fremitus occur in first molars or second molars unless they're periodontally compromised. And that isn't just restricted to the teeth breaking, but also our restorations breaking. And if we are looking at that, we've been talking about two forces. There are two forces that threaten our success, and that is compression, that is teeth coming together, and then shear, that is forces landing on an incline. Now, the thing about compression is compression is when we have the occlusal forces onto a flat landing area. All dental materials, whether you're talking about glass, gold, composite, acrylic, enamel, everything, all of those materials deal better in compressive force than shear force. So how can we avoid the shear forces that lead to the destruction and damage not only to our restorations, but our reputations? Well, one of the approaches that I would like to do quite simply is just thinking about how do I like back teeth to touch? Well, when I have back teeth touch, I think about the opposing cusp being a hammer because hammers break things and hammers drive nails. So if this hammer is coming down and it is hitting both of those inclined slopes right here and right there, what each of those slopes becomes is a nail. And those nails are off axis and they're gonna be at 90 degrees to that contact point and that tangent. And you have what we'll see is a splitting force. So how can we get away from that? Well, one thing we can do is we can narrow the hammer. That is, we can reshape the opposing cusp. So it is received on a flat receiving area. Well, one of the challenges with that is what if you need to adjust that? Well, if I just adjusted that and I lowered that and go back to here and say that that crown on the upper was high and I adjusted it so it's out of occlusion, I would actually be hitting again on the inclined slopes and splitting the tooth in half. 
So how can we get around that? One of the things that I absolutely loved, and I was introduced to this by uh, Russ DeBrew, and I know that Dr. Jeff Baggett did a wonderful, wonderful presentation on landing pads a few years ago at the American Equilibration Society, is I like to have an elevated contact point. So that elevated contact point actually allows for the opposing cusp to land on a flat receiving area. Aside from doing that, I can also still narrow the hammer, that is reshape the cusp, so that we have a, a flat, narrow cusp that is touching against a flat receiving area. And that is how we can minimize, minimize the forces that damage our restorations. So looking at how that might happen here, and this is a mounting for a full mouth equilibration, uh, but I just wanna really look at it from a single tooth aspect is if we reshape the buccal cusp and we reshape the palatal cusp, that is reshape the buccal cusp of the lower second molar and reshape the palatal cusp of the upper second molar, we can actually change the shape of those two cusps so that that landing pad is now on a flat receiving area and that the forces that are directed in that closure are driven down the long axis of the tooth. So how does that actually happen in reality? How does that happen in application? Well, here I'd like to show you a little bit of a painful lesson. And I got this crown back from the laboratory technician. And by the way, he allows me to use this picture. Uh, won't name him, but I uh, he does allow me to use this picture and share the story. And this crown came back from the lab and it was clearly out of occlusion. And I don't mean just a little bit, it was a lot, lot, lot. And Dr. Panky says, when the patient closed, the teeth should all touch without deflection. And we have distribution and load. That is, we have distribution and compressive forces. But when we take number 19 out of the equation, or it's actually upside down, if we take number three out of the equation or the, the gold crown, well, then the opposing tooth is also out of occlusion. Is that okay? And honestly, I can't tell you because that has to do with risk factors. How much of a parafunctioner is this patient? But what if I did two crowns and I say, leave it lightly out of occlusion? Or what if I do a quadrant and I say, leave it lightly out of occlusion? There is a tipping point that that is gonna be a consequence where we have lack of distribution in load. So what can I what what can we do about this? So what I went ahead and did was I actually duplicated the model with the crown in place. And I thought, how could this be different? And what I did was I put a little sticky wax and I put a little piece of gray wax and I went tap, tap, and I created a flat receiving area for the opposing cusp. I could even take another piece of wax and go tap, tap, and make a second receiving area. And now I have not only axial load and compression, but I have axial load and compression and in distribution within that tooth. I could even get crazier and I could elevate one of those cusps so that it could touch the opposing flat receiving area. And I could add the ivory wax so that it is, how do I want it to fit, making my landing pads and my cusp tips, and then how do I want it to look by adding the cusp slopes and the marginal ridges and the buckle and lingual groove and what have you. And suddenly that Dr. Dawson picture that you saw a few slides ago where Dr. Panky said the T should touch without deflection, that deflection and that touch can be wherever we need it to be. One of the challenges we've had is most occlusion that we've been taught in school at least, is all based on a class one occlusion. Well, what if the cusp isn't in the right place for it to look like the textbook? Well, then you can put a landing pad wherever you like. And in this case, you can see on the left side of the screen, here's that flat landing pad on the mesial marginal ridge. Here is the gold crown where that flat receiving area is. And that is that flat receiving area right there. And we can still have the beauty of all of those ridges and slopes and grooves, as opposed to something, I don't know if how many of you are familiar with traditional nathology, where we had not just one contact, two contacts, three contacts, 
per cusp that were opposing the three contacts in the fossa where that was receiving. Those area, those days are far gone behind me. And looking forward, I really like to have things that are nice and easy. A single dot on a single tooth that is axially loaded without there being a deflective contact. If you're not familiar with this, by the way, there is something that is actually white articulating film. There's only one company in the world that I'm aware that makes it. It is um, Bausch, based actually in the U.S. here out of uh, New Hampshire. And there I actually use a thicker black or blue articulating film or paper, and then I use white. And the white will stand out just like an absolute headlight. Really, really neat stuff. So I can put that in the chat later, or Desi can type it out, Bausch, B-A-U-C-S, C, S C H, uh, and they're in Hanover, eight micron uh, shim stock. So here you can see one of my teaching partners, Dr. Lane Ochi, who actually cast this crown, beautiful, overdone, crazy anatomy, but you can still see those two landing pads that are sitting there. Uh, if you haven't heard, I will be doing a focus course this December of compromise to uh, co-discovery. And that is going to be with Dr. Lane Ochi, my teaching partner, Dr. Lucas, or <laughs> Dr. Brett Burris, who has recently finished up the continuum, and also my technician and teaching partner, Lucas Lamont, who practices at his craft out of Niche Dental Studios, which is Josh Polanski's lab. So if you'd like to join us in December, you can always hop on to the Panky website, look under Focus Courses, com uh, Compromise to Co-Discovery. But back to our program. So let's talk about those fractured cusps that happen on second molars, because I'd like to talk a little bit about loss of restorative space. So when we have a broken terminal tooth, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but you prep a second molar and you get that call from the lab and they say, hey, doc, really nice prep. Uh, mind if I send you a reduction coping? And I say, no, sure. What, how much room do you need? And they say, oh, about a millimeter or two. And you're like, how did that possibly happen? I know that I prepped enough. Well, if we look at that and we look at these second molars, I talked about screening methods that we can foresee how we're gonna lose some of that space. So just as I saw and I showed you before with the skull where the, where the condyle seated and we were only hitting second molars, well, what if we prep the teeth, those were that first contact in centric relation and we started at MIP, we prepped maybe the first or even the second, the second molar, maybe the second molar and the first molar and that condyle is not seated and that condyle now shifts or seats, then we have that loss of restorative room. I know this is a lot to stuff into a webinar, but I actually want to show you how to screen for this. So looking at the methodology that you have here, eight leaves is basically a millimeter. It'll vary from <clears throat> leaf gauge to leaf gauge. These are the Great Lakes orthodontics leaf gauges. And three to one more or less, some can say a two or two to one, but let's just say a three in the front is one in the back. So if you're not in a seated position and we're in MIP and we put the leaf gauge in and we tell, ask the patient to clench on their back teeth and they're still hitting and we keep adding leaves, we keep adding leaves until they're not hitting teeth, which allows the condyle to seat. Then we can actually count the number of leaves at the front and let's just say it's 20 leaves. And 20 leaves in the front is, how many is that? So uh, eight leaves is a millimeter. So 16 leaves is two millimeters. So 20 leaves is gonna be 2.5. 2.5 millimeters in the front is gonna be 0.8 in the back. So we actually have the potential to lose 2.5 millimeters here, or 0.8 millimeters from that two and a half since I was just confusing there. So if we have two and a half millimeters in the front, divide that by three, it's about 0.8. And so three in the back, three in the front, one in the back. And looking at what I just did is we are putting that leaf gauge in there, allowing the condyle to seat, and we're screening that second molar touch. So going through that, I use red, red and black, black. 
And I go through the process, like I told you, of uh, having putting the leaves, having the patient try to squeeze their teeth together. And if they hit and I say, are you hitting? They say, yes, I am. Then I, I, I trust them. If they're not sure, I'll start actually putting red in and not to actually mark, just to tactily feel. And I might go tug, tug to see if they're actually still hitting. I'll keep adding leaves until they're not hitting anymore. I know I'm going over this quite quickly. I know that Dr. Brady has a great leaf gauge video on restorative nation that you check, can check out. So when we get to the point that we're not hitting any teeth, then I can start dialing off the leaf until leaves until they're only hitting one tooth. And I can mark that with the leaf gauge. And wouldn't you know it, that there is that first point. Why do I use red? Because I don't have to clean any of it off. And then the black mark will overwrite red. And there you can see that first contact. So eight leaves in the front is one millimeter. One millimeter in the front is a third of the millimeter in the back. And just going through everything that you just saw there. So if I take this to an actual patient that you saw, and here's that patient, and they have busted off that cusp, and I'm wondering, hmm, am I at the risk of losing restorative room? And I go through this whole sort of scenario, and when I go through that scenario and find that first touch and that first contact, there's that first contact right there on the fracture. So what is going to go on and how can I lose restorative space? Well, if you look on the left side of the screen, if that's their first contact in CR, and then they squeeze their teeth together to MIP, there can be not just a seating of the condyle, but there can actually be a lateral shift. So how does that lead to loss of restorative room? Well, if you take that same tooth and you prep away based on MIP, and you prep away whatever that green line is, let's just say a millimeter and a half, but you no longer now have that lateral shift, that millimeter and a half that you have is maybe only a millimeter or maybe less. So what does the leaf gauge screen allow me to do? It allows me to know that I had the potential to lose that 0.5 or 0.8 millimeters of restorative clearance and not have to go with a full mounting and face bow and CR record, but this is just a simple trick that a leaf gauge can help us screen for loss of restorative room. And then just make that little bit of extra restorative room. So in this case that I showed you with the second molar, <clears throat> I went ahead, and this isn't my case, actually my wife's case from probably about 20 years ago, and I was just the photographer, but she took a burr and she sank it to depth. She didn't, didn't sink it to depth, we actually measured it. And when we measured that, you can see that the length or the depth of that burr is 1.98 millimeters. Fairly significant, right? But after we did this, anticipating that there would be a seating of the condyle and loss of restorative room, let's see what happened. Because next what I tried to do is we tried to actually put a 1.5 millimeter loop through the area that we just took two millimeters away and it would not fit. So what do we have to do? Just like I showed you in the animation stick figure tooth, I just had to take a little bit more away and now a two millimeter loop would fit and I have all the dots in the right place. You might say, wow, two millimeters, that's a lot to take off of a second molar. Well, for me, that's dental insurance. And I don't mean Delta and I don't mean Cigna. I mean giving the patient enough restorative material so that they can beat it up over the years and not get a perforation like you saw at the beginning of the presentation. So how about super erupting second molars? So it's very similar to what you just saw, but you know, a little bit different because we have a different kind of loss of restorative room. So in this case, the patient has flecked out a restoration that posing cusp has actually super erupted into that lower space. And we are at less than a millimeter from the central fossa to the gingiva. So how do you want it to look? How do you make it fit? So went ahead and waxed this tooth up. And when I wax the tooth up, you can see we got the dot in the right place on the distal marginal ridge and dot more or less in the right place on the palatal cusp. But how does it fit? Well, it fits like that. 
And this is a challenge. So what's the plan? How do we make this fit? Well, you can go through all of the mantras that we talked about, which are, you know, reshape, restore, reposition. But what would we do? So this is an actual patient. And when I came in to hygiene, she had a concern that her teeth were hot and cold sensitive, or 18 was, the lower second molar. It didn't uh, feel like a tooth and it hurt when she bit. And without getting into a big communication program, I, I've done another webinar on purpose, process, and presentation. I'm gonna touch on it just real lightly here. Her goal is have it not be hot and cold sensitive, not hurt when she bites and have it feel like a tooth. So I spoke to her and I said, well, we can make the lower feel like a tooth, hopefully not be hot and cold sensitive, but it's not gonna fit. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, when you close, you're only going to hit on that tooth and on the upper. And she says, well, couldn't you adjust just the, the upper? And I said, of course you could. And, and we could reshape that. And I didn't want to make her feel stupid. She was actually becoming a co-diagnostician with me. She was becoming part of the process. So I said, well, we could do that. I know your goal is to make it so it doesn't hurt when you bite and make it look like a tooth. And we could restore the lower second molar, sorry for the uh, non-US numbering system, crown 3-7, which is 18, and adjust 2-7, which is 15. The benefits, it would make it not hurt when you bite, make the lower second molar feel like a tooth, but that may make the upper tooth hurt, need additional treatment and costs, which could involve a crown or root canal. And the second molar wouldn't look like a tooth. She did not like those options. And so... If we wax that tooth back up, and this is how we fit, what are our options to make that fit so that the rest of the teeth come together in MIP? Well, we could remove number 15. That's not really realistic for her goals either. And what we ended up talking to her about is like, well, Meredith, in order to make 18 feel like a tooth, not be hot and cold sensitive, and not hurt when you bite, what we can do is actually reposition the upper tooth so that we don't have to adjust number 15 so that one doesn't hurt when you bite and it feels like a tooth and doesn't need those extra uh, possible treatments. So here we went with orthodontic intrusion. So we intruded the upper second molar, which allowed and gave us restorative room to actually build up what was lost on the flecked out restoration and the uh, significant wear that existed on that second molar. As I said, this is a gateway tooth for discussions that go far beyond the second molar when we're looking at more comprehensive care, when we're looking at more extensive equilibrations, rehabilitation. But I just wanted to kind of give you an insight into that is all these different ways that we can change the way teeth are shaped. So intruding 15 to fit, so 18 fits, makes it so it doesn't hurt when she bites, eats or, or drinks hots and colds, and makes it feel like a tooth. The process is crowning the upper second molar, or the lower second, <laughs> I wrote that wrong, crowning the lower second molar and intruding the upper second molar. So reaches all of her goals and uh, helps her get to a happy place with conservative dentistry. So if you try to decide on process before you've clarified outcome, you're setting yourself up for frustration, inefficiency, and you close yourself off to the possibilities that you might not have even been aware of. So here, what we did with that super erupted second molar on the left side of the screen is we intruded it and we were able to restore that. This was done actually by throwing a TAD temporary anchorage device on the buckle and also the palatal, throwing a rubber band around that and super uh, or intruding the upper second molar. And as we did that, we built up the lower second molar with composite. And eventually we restored that with a crown. So thinking about all these things are what is possible if we think about the outcome. How do we want it to look? How do we make it fit? How do we mitigate threats? And in this case, we restored Meredith with a full cast gold crown. So no pain on biting is her goal. We can visualize the outcome of how we want it to look. 
and then look at the challenges of how we make it fit. And then we can pick that refer, reposition, and restore using several of the R's here and even slightly reshaping the upper palatal cusp. I want to show you a little bit another ortho intrusion case without too much of a story, but this patient uh, had actually some incredibly severe wear on a lower first molar. And we had tried bonding this with composite and uh, again and again, and it failed. But this patient actually had a family history, believe it or not, of orthognathic surgery. And he knew from his family's skeletal genetics that this was something that he wanted to pursue. But looking at how flat his, sec his first molars were, he's only 25 or 26 years old. And I think, how can we buy John more time for the future in his life that he can keep his teeth as healthy as possible to open up health down the road for him? That is not moving straight to orthognathic because it isn't realistic for him where he is in his life, in his education. And he wants to get into the job force and he knows how much that costs. So how can we help, as Bob Barkley says, help our patients get worse at the slowest rate possible? Well, we can also approach orthodontic intrusion here where we could intrude the lower first molar and give ourselves some restorative room. In this case, you can see how incredibly flat that lower first molar is, and that is not prepped. I was showing that to Desi a little bit before the program. He has absolutely decimated that, most likely some reflux, possibly some apnea involved uh, earlier in his life. But what we're able to do is with Invisalign, working with Dr. Don Neely, we actually had the tooth intruded, and then we moved the adjacent second molar and second bicuspid away so that we did not have to actually prep the tooth proximally. And when we did that, we just did some little divots in the occluding surface for retention. So this is basically a no prep overlay. Here you can see how we moved the second molar to the distal and the first or the second bicuspid a bit to the mesial. So we didn't actually have to prep proximal boxes. And there is the dye model. And there is the lithium disilicate overlay that we provided the patient with. And there is the final restoration in place. And there we leave John open for a lifetime of possibilities of future uh, aesthetic work, future restorative work, future more uh, comprehensive orthodontic and orthognathic surgery. And that takes me back to uh, C1, where we heard Dr. Pankey say, or quoted, you know, moves forward slowly, but with haste, and help our patients get worse at the slowest rate possible, and comprehensive exam may take 10 years. Comprehensive care is not about how quickly we can achieve a perfect state of health, but that we are always moving the patient towards health and away from a state of unhealth or pathology. Long story short, keeping options open for John, not cutting down his teeth earlier in his life and helping him move forward with his desired goals as he ages, moves into the workforce and moves forward. So that is John's initial presentation on the left. That is mid-aligner therapy, and that is his 26-month post-op. Honestly, at this case, I have seen John, and he is, I believe, eight years post-op, and his bite wings I did not add tonight, but uh, they're looking pretty much the same as they were there. So the last case that I'd like to kind of share with you is that dished-out occlusal anatomy, <clears throat> and this is the one where I say, this one looks really, really easy until it isn't. So these are the ones that are a combination of almost everything we've seen so far and uh, without an orthodontic component is we see the super eruption, we see the significant wear, but we also see a lot of tooth structure there that is untouched. So 
what you're looking at here is the distal view of the second molars on the patient's left and right side. And I've actually ground back the models uh, to about the buccal and lingual groove. So about halfway mesial distal through the tooth. So why am I doing this? Is This is something that can be done in digital or analog. Here I'm going to show you in analog dentistry how I approach this case and how my laboratory technician, Lucas Lamont, and I uh, executed this case. Because if I think about this case, it's very similar to Meredith, that uh, case where we restored number 18 and intruded 15. But here we have a little bit more restorative control is that we have restorative indica indications on all of the molars. So if I can imagine uh, what we have there, what, I, what I've done is I've actually measured the model analog from buccal to lingual along the white line, then just brought in a ruler uh, JPEG from a Google search and calibrated it to this distance here so that I can actually measure how far on the model it is. So on the model from the central fossa on number 18, I am one, two millimeters, two and a quarter millimeters. So if I take away one millimeter to put back restorative room, you know, I am getting possibly dangerously close to the pulp or I'm going to have a very short tooth. But remember the mantra, how do you want it to look? How do you make it fit? How do you mitigate threats? So here, I want to think about just digitally, and I've done this in Keynote or PowerPoint, I've drawn in where I think I'd like the occlusal table, and that is the occlusal table of the mandibular molars in white, and where I'd like the occlusal table of the maxillary molars in red, and that way I can sort of design everything based on that. That is, I can imagine where I want my maxillary occlusal plane, and some of that is going to be reductive. And some of that, as you can see on the uh, lingual cusp of number 18, actually, I don't probably need to take anything away. And if I imagine where I want the maxillary occlusal plane, you can see I actually don't need to prep in the central fossa there at all. In fact, I could possibly build that up. I think about digitally in an analog approach where I want my contact points. And then I can think about where I want my occlusal reduction. Again, this can be done in a digital approach or an analog approach. Here, I'm doing a little bit of digital analog is that I'm using digital models, but designing them uh, digitally in Keynote or PowerPoint. So I can help, uh, help envision where my planes will be I can also use this to communicate with my technician where I want the wax up to be. And here Lucas was able to do that and provide me with the landing pads that we discussed a little bit earlier in the presentation. And that is actually red sticky wax. He and I came across that a uh, little bit by happenstance. We wanted it to stand out more in our lecture photos, but we found it was actually amazing wax uh, for holding occlusion when we were waxing and casting crowns. And that is back from the beginning of the program where I talked about elevating the nail so the hammer has that flat receiving area to have the compression and receive that compression. We have the same thing on the opposing teeth. So dots on the upper and lower in the flat receiving area, so stable that I could even squeeze my onlay provisionals together and they didn't rock. So even just that one touch per tooth can provide incredible, incredible stability. So walking through that on the upper left of the screen, I actually have a bite registration material that I put there. And on the top center of the screen, I've sectioned it down this central fossa so that I can look and actually use that as an occlusal reduction guide because here, remember, some places I want to cut, some places I want to add. And I have prepped these all for actually partial coverage gold. You can see the provisionals down there in the lower right. And if you saw in the ceramic where I did the potholes here, you also saw that I left quite a bit of uh, retention and resistance grooves. This I picked up from my teaching partner, Dr. Lane Ochi. 
uh, and he's just wonderful with legacy concepts. So with his legacy concepts, I'd like to show you what retention and resistance. So retention is keeping a crown from coming off and resistance is keeping a crown from rocking. And here, let me just go ahead and play the video. All right, so what I want to show you, people are asking about this, increasing retention radically on short teeth and short preps. You can see that I have quite a number of boxes for both increasing retention and resistance form. Pick that up from my good buddy, Lane Ochi. But rubber meets the road is you can put that on there and that does not come off. And you think about, you know, retention on short preps, this isn't even cemented yet. And even if I tap that on the table, I have to get it fairly significantly. So short preps, there's your solution. And if that doesn't help enough, you can always carve a panky cross into the occlusal of your preps to have uh, LD himself look down from above and uh, give you extra <laughs> retention and resistance. So here are the preps that I did. So full cast gold, that is JVRT. You can see the occlusal landing pads there in the central fossa. They're going to show up really bright here in just a minute. And there are the upper crowns. And that is the occlusal design based on the analog and PowerPoint slash keynote designs that we had, that we have set everything up, including the preparation, the cusp location to be received by the final restorations. And those are the uh, restorations in place. And you can see the white articulating paper there. That is actually some Reliax. So I'll show you that on the film. So here's the film, the white film, that eight micron white Bausch. And there's the landing pad on the mesial. There's the landing pad in the central fossa. And there's the landing pad in the central fossa. And there's the landing pad, or is the, there is the cut, touch on both of the palatal cusps. So I know that was a lot to jam into just 50 minutes, but if I could give you some takeaway lessons that helped me over the years, if we have exclusive second molar wear we need to look at distributing the load through some sort of equilibration, orthodontics, what have you. If we have super erupted opposing cusps, you know, reduce the threat, create the space. And creating that space can, again, be through restoring, reshaping, repositioning. And dished out occlusal anatomy, designing for health, success, and longevity of our restorations. I want to thank everyone for your kind attention. I did go just 49 minutes there. A compromise to co-discovery, a treatment planning journey. So this is coming up in December at the Institute, and this is really the first time that we have done this outside of a study club. Uh, just give you a real small taste of it. We are actually going to be looking at a patient at several points in his life where they just want to fix what's broken. And they, another point in their life, they want to actually work on the forces that are causing all the damage, but they don't want to get into all that fancy dentistry. And we can look at equilibration. And finally, we're going to look with the same patient at not only equilibration, but an aesthetic rehabilitation. We're going to be reviewing lab procedures, treatment planning, communication, and also case presentation. Uh, it is going to be a really fun time, and December is not a bad place to be uh, down, uh, time to be down on the key.